Thank you very much, Susan. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, and I'll say hello first. I'm Alice Mann. Um, I am a workstream manager for J4JH. Like Susan, I'm relatively new. I've been J4JH for four months now. Um, and I manage three of the J4JH workstreams, one of them data security, as well as discovery and data use and researcher identities. As Susan said, I'm chairing today's session on responsible data, and I'm delighted to welcome our four speakers today. Um, we'll hear from each of our speakers in turn, and then at the end, we have a decent amount of time for discussion and Q&A afterwards. And of course, you can submit your questions via Slido. So first, I would like to welcome uh, JP Hubo, who um, is a full professor at EPFL, uh, the head of the Laboratory for Data Security. He is the academic director for the Centre for Digital Trust and leads the Data Protection in Personalised Health project funded by the ETH Council. And of course, is co-chair of the Data Security Workstream for J4GH. So today he's going to talk to us about um, truly privacy prefer preserving federated analytics for precision medicine with multi-party homomorphic encryption. So if I can pass over to JP, you can. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction. Can, can you hear me well? Yes, very good. Okay, so uh, good uh, uh, afternoon, good morning, dear colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so this uh, talk will indeed focus on the uh, truly pr privacy preserving analytics for personal medicine, uh, and um, this is a work that has, was carried out has been carried out actually with a number of uh, uh, co-workers, both on the medical side and the, on the computer science uh, side. And I do acknowledge their uh, uh, fantastic contributions. Uh, next slide, please. So there exists a number of solutions uh, for distributed learning. Uh, it can be either fully centralized or it can be meta-analysis, it can be decentralized, it can be differential privacy decentralized. Um, it can be cryptographic uh, decentralized. All of these, we have really looked into the other details and the features of these uh, uh, solutions, and they come with, uh, with drawbacks that uh, brought us to back to the blackboard and say, try to find uh, uh, let's say, a uh, 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 better solution. So please click. Next slide. Click, voila. Uh, because many of them have data leakage. Uh, click, please, again. Um, so differential privacy deliberately needs to introduce noise in some way, which is uh, undesirable. Click again. Voila. Uh, those existing solutions uh, that rely on cryptographic uh, uh, techniques or have a or suffer of a very limited number of parties. Click. <laughs> and so we introduce a farm. So we'll see on the next slide what it is about. So farm is, we believe, the holy grail for secure federated analytics of uh, health data. And this is actually uh, a paper that will soon appear in uh, uh, Nature Communications joint work with uh, at the MIT, the Broad Institute, and at the Lausanne University uh, Hospital. Click. Voila. So what we do here is, uh, uh, what we've shown is that we've taken an existing studies. Uh, here is, is uh, one, one of the, the examples that is shown here is a GWAS that was uh, published in uh, Nature Genetics uh, uh, actually two years ago. And what we've shown is that we can reproduce. So the data, the study that was published was actually uh, centralized with all the data in clear text. We can do the same. We chunk artificially, let's say, this is data set in, uh, for example, three parts, uh, keep the data separated, and show that it is possible to obtain the same results with the same level of precision without transferring the data. So the data remain in their silos where they are. And this shows that, uh, and this I think is exactly what the G4G is trying to achieve and will be uh, uh, actually a fundamental building block for in order to move uh, uh, forward. We also show that this can be achieved with a runtime that is uh, 
uh, uh, really very, very uh, modest. What is shown on this example is uh, actually survival curves with a kaplan meyer a statics a statistic computation on the next slide. Let me move please to the next slide. We show uh, the similar uh, kind of uh, result in this case with for GWAS. Uh, and as you can see on uh, small a, is this is the original approach. On small b is actually uh, this. What it shows is that the the, the outcome, the Manhattan, if you wish plot, is exactly the same if the work is uh, if the computations are carried out on. Uh, decentralized data under uh, uh, encryption. Whereas uh, what uh, uh, C shows here is that if this is done independently uh, uh, or let's say with uh, trying to, to, to make the computations at each place and then in some way trying to compute average and so on, this leads essentially to nowhere. Let's move to the next slide. So what is, what is shown here is the uh, how much that takes. Of course, so GWAS, as you know, is a quite a demanding uh, computation. So the runtime is in the order of uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, minutes still. Uh, but uh, there's still uh, substantial improvements that are uh, possible by making use of uh, uh, GPUs as, as opposed to CPUs. So this can bring a, a 10x uh, improvement. And in any case, it's much, much faster than having to uh, have the lawyers on each side to agree on how, uh, uh, well, let's say, on the um, legal protections that have to be set up for a given uh, collaboration. So we, we, this would essentially streamline the whole process of uh, uh, collaboration on a specific, uh, let's say, on, on, on data sets. For example, the scale of, uh, of the GA4GH. Next slide, please. So this is built on a certain number of building blocks. One is homomorphic encryption. So in a nutshell, what homomorphic encryption does is to provide the ability to make computations on data while the data are encrypted. So I'll spare you the details, but this is essentially the key message. It is the ability to make computations on data that are encrypted. On the next, please, next slide. Now the next building block is about secure multi-party computation, which is the ability to make computations on data sets that are distributed in different places without moving these uh, data. And then the third building block, ne uh, next slide, please, is the combination of the two. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, yeah, uh, next slide. <laughs> voilà, is multi-party homomorphic encryption. Is this uh, the combination of those two? And this is actually the trick that makes the whole thing, let's say, reaching the level of performance that is uh, uh, needed, is essentially uh, the ability to uh, encrypt uh, under uh, a, a public collective key that is known by all parties. But the corresponding secret key, the key for decryption, is actually distributed among the whole uh, parties, which means that the, uh, the more parties are, let's say, the more partners, uh, institutions are in the federation, the more, uh, the, the, even the higher the, 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 the robustness of the whole scheme uh, becomes. If we go to the next slide, please. So next, uh, uh, actually, building block is federated learning, which is the ability to have local iteration that uh, refine a, a given ML, uh, an ML model little by little, and then have a global model update that leverages on the partial uh, results. Next slide, please. Well, all, let's say the outcome of uh, uh, this, um, let's say the, the fact that we have shown that this can be applied in various uh, areas. Uh, so of course the medical sector, but also in other places such as uh, cybersecurity or insurance uh, has generated so much interest that we have decided to uh, launch a, a startup. Uh, called the Two Insights, so I'm uh, declaration of uh, conflict. So I'm one of the co-founders, uh, and uh, this is uh, um, is actually the way for us to be able to provide something that is sustainable in the in the long run. Because I'm with an academic lab that is not supposed to provide, let's say, commercial solutions. But this is something that is uh, actually uh, provides, a, uh, let's say, long-term perspective for all these, uh, uh, let's say, capabilities, and that will provide either open source code or at least uh, open source APIs uh, for, for the most, uh, let's say, advanced uh, computations. Next slide, please. Well, so of this, we are also derived a, a system that uh, we are deploying currently in uh, Swiss, uh, we've already started deploying Swiss uh, hospitals. 
uh, Medco that uh, um, actually is, uh, so if we move to the next slide, so it's based on the techniques that I've mentioned. And what it does is first it uh, supports uh, exploration, uh, cohort exploration. So for example, how many individuals with a given set of features are available in, uh, in the Federation. And then if we move to the next slide, uh, the second uh, feature is the uh, uh, next slide, please, uh, is uh, uh, actually the medical analysis. So the ability to make computations. Uh, so as, including the example we have seen with Kaplan-Meier or linear logic, logistic regression or neural networks on, on the uh, cohort that has been identified. Next slide, please. So this is an example of application in the Swiss uh, uh, landscape. So uh, first question, how many uh, adult cancer patients consenting, blah, 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 uh, are, are there as exploration? And then question two is among these patients, uh, what is the reverse survival for patients with and without mutation and so on? Next slide, please. Uh, we've also started to experiment installation at the international level. So we have currently one station in Houston, one in the Netherlands, and one in uh, uh, Italy. Next slide, please. Uh, and there is a live demo that you can want to you may want to check whenever you wish at uh, medco.gpfl.ch slash demo. Next slide. Now the scalability results that show that essentially the let's say layer of protection that we are bringing in most cases essentially brings relatively little overhead, uh, uh, and uh, because um, this is uh, we have paired actually this uh, with I two B two for those of you who, who know this uh, tool, and actually much of the computing time most goes to the database operations as opposed to the uh, uh, encryption decryption. Next slide, please. Now we've worked also with uh, legal scholars and ethicists uh, to check uh, GDPR uh, legal compliance. And so we have uh, published a paper uh, that has appeared in uh, JMIR, the title of which and the uh, link uh, uh, to which are provided in on this uh, slide. So it's really joint work between, let's say, bioinformaticians, ethicists, law, uh, uh, law scholars, and uh, uh, computer scientists. Next slide, please. Well, we also uh, went through a, a, something that is called a DPIA, so Data Protection Impact Assessment. It's quite a pretty thick uh, document that shows essentially uh, what changes when introducing uh, such uh, solutions in, uh, into existing systems. And so you see, can see on the left hand side the situation as it was before and a and situation as it is after the introduction of uh, this uh, solution. And so as you can guess, the red is, is bad and green is good based on a certain number of uh, criteria. I'll spare you the details, but I think you get the gist of the whole thing by looking uh, quickly at the, at the slide. Next slide, please. Then we got also the feedback from the Swiss authorities on, uh, on, on this document uh, that essentially says that as no entity has a full decryption key, it seems indeed unlikely that the attacker could decrypt and abuse the stolen data. So we have received essentially kind of uh, a vetting from, uh, from these uh, authorities. And uh, then we move on uh, with uh, now a, a larger scale uh, deployment of this uh, uh, tool set. Next slide, please. Well, then we also studied the positioning of what we have done with respect to similar distributed platforms. So those that are the most known to, to, to uh, those on this call are probably the Shrine and uh, the Data Shield from uh, those colleagues from, from UK and then Vantage 6 with, from the Netherlands and, uh, and Germany, uh, based on a certain number of criteria that are organized in uh, usability, privacy, uh, security, and uh, functionality. Uh, and uh, Medco being a more recent tool, of course, uh, 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 checks uh, uh, actually all the, all, the, all the boxes. Next slide, please. Well, uh, so now we have also devoted some thoughts to what this would like in the case there is a willingness to introduce this in the GA4GH ecosystem. And I put really speculative on the title because there is no decision whatsoever that has been made or just, let's say, ongoing discussion with the Elixir Cloud and the AI driver project. So medium term possible goal would be to use tests to call the Medco APIs. And then the more longer term would be to turn Medco in, into a GA4GH tool uh, involved. And please, let's move to the next slide. So the medium term, voila, medium term goal would be that is depicted actually on, uh, on this slide. I guess it's relatively straightforward. And the next slide 
shows uh, the uh, how it would uh, operate, uh, uh, what can be done in the long term, and the relationship with, uh, let's say, the tool registry service, the workflow execution service, and the data repository repository service where essentially Medco would be uh, the engine that uh, federates the different uh, 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 let's say repositories next slide please well our conclusion so what uh, we have shown is uh, essentially I think we have solved the problem of federated analytics for medical uh, uh, data uh, the solution uh, consists in relying on multi-party homomorphic encryption so it is, uh, we rely, we, we, let's say, leverage on the fact that it is possible to share without sharing. It is possible to perform computations without seeing the data. And this is based on decades, let's say, of uh, research in computer science uh, that uh, is based on, let's say, uh, mathematically proven uh, properties. Uh, and uh, so the what it provides is a protection of the partial aggregates, which is a feature that is missing in all other uh, solutions. So we have seen the scalability. We have also shown that it works on real size medical data sets. And we believe this will be a game changer for ML on medical data. And we believe GF4GH to be really uh, one of the probably the most promising adopters of these uh, techniques. I've mentioned Medco. And you may want to check uh, the website dbbh.ch where you also find uh, all the papers we have published on uh, this uh, topic. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, JP, for that fascinating talk. Um, thank you to those who've already submitted questions. We're going to hold them till the end and, and go on to our next speaker, but please do keep submitting if you have any now. Um, so next, um, I'd like to welcome Jonathan Dursey to talk to us today. Um, Jonathan has over 25 years experience using um, large scale computing to advance science. He currently works at Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children on the CANDIG project, uh, helping to build a federated platform for national scale analysis of locally controlled private genomics data um, to connect Canada's health genomics data. And he's going to speak to us today about CANDIG and responsible data. So I will hand over to you, Jonathan. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks very much. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. So CanDig is building a, a platform and infrastructure for, for supporting data sharing. And we've been learning from the GF4JH really since even before our beginning. Our, our initial design and planning was strongly shaped by discussions going on in the GF4JH community. And, and some of our code actually came directly from the GF4JH community. And this has been true in matters technical. And on the next slide, please. Thanks. From policy. Uh, point of view as well. So one of the ways this has played out, next slide please, has been around uh, early discussions about what eventually became the foundational principles for responsible sharing of genomic and health related data coming from the GF4GH. Respect, respecting individuals, families and communities, advancing research and scientific knowledge, promoting health well-being and the fair distribution of benefits, and fostering trust, integrity and reciprocity. So these are these are fundamental principles and there's some tension between some of these principles and and the right way to resolve some of these tensions is really going to depend on the context in which you're trying to build a, a technical solution next slide please and so today i want to tell you a little bit about our context and the decisions we've made and, and our interpretation of these principles in our federation design first and then implementation Next slide, please. So our con context is Canada and Canada's confederation with healthcare and by extension health data, the jurisdiction of provinces. So national projects require some way of collaborating across different regulatory statutory requirements. There's uh, multiple ways of doing that, but we wanted to help make it a little easier. Next slide, please. So when designing our federation, uh, we wanted to support the respect for individuals, families, and communities by, by ensuring local control over data, make sure that the clinicians, custodians closest to the participants were accountable for final data decisions. Next slide, please. Thanks. We wanted to support the advance of research and scientific knowledge by making it easier to maintain and begin national projects, 
by making it easier for data custodians to be able to, in good conscience, make their data available for discovery. And we focused really initially on data discovery and exploration, these research first mile barriers. That's where we felt we could do the most good the most quickly. Next slide, please. Uh, for promoting health, well being, and fair distribution of benefits, again, we wanted to empower local custodians and empower data programs to make it, uh, to allow them to share, make their data discoverable in a way they're comfortable with. Next slide, please. And finally, fostering trust, integrity, and reciprocity. Uh, we really wanted to build a peer to peer federation, uh, local authorization control local infrastructure for authentication using trusted local data infrastructure and make sure that our sites our platform and our data programs are all collaborators and governance next slide please and that became uh, candig the canadian distributed infrastructure for genomics uh, we from those foundations we took it took a little while but we developed very clear roles and responsibilities between the platform the sites and the data programs. And this, this division of responsibilities was essential for responsible data handling because we had to know who ultimately was responsible for what. Next slide, please. So we're a distributed infrastructure. Uh, there's no central hard infrastructure of any sort. Uh, the, the infrastructure there is, is coordination around policy process, software development and governance. Next slide, please. Thanks. So as mentioned, uh, authentication, we use uh, federated recognition of, of distributed local identities. Individual institutions are, are responsible for identity management. Next slide, please. Thanks. And for authorization, as mentioned, local control. It's the data hosting sites are the ones that are best able to make authorization decisions and uh, most, most responsible for the consequences of those decisions. Uh, but they need to be in, they need platform level data to make these decisions. They may rely on claims from a user's home institution about the nature of that user. They may require uh, information about local or platform level claims like DAC portals. And we're moving to using GA4GH passport visas to communicate those claims, that authorization related information to the sites. Next slide, please. And our, our trust model uh, right now is it was very strong trust between sites. Uh, we're in the business of helping participating hospitals and researchers connect to, su to support their existing data sharing projects. Uh, and we have Candig team members at each site uh, developing and operating the stack. Next slide, please. So that uh, was our, our federation design. Uh, then the question becomes, how do these principles inform our implementation? And this has been on our mind quite a bit lately, because we're just about finally to put into production a new version of our platform. And so we've been thinking about this quite a bit lately. Next slide, please. So we started off uh, really all about genomics, but health data research marches onwards. And there's increasingly uh, rich data types, data types that are different enough they, they don't make sense to keep in the same data store or serve with the same data services. So we've needed to ensure data access policies are being deci decided uniformly across a growing range of services. And we're implementing that with a central policy decision point that evalu evaluates each request against a declarative domain specific language that's relatively easy to read. So that gives us one place to maintain policies and audit the decisions against those policies. Next slide, please. Uh, we want to make it as easy as possible to have secure deployments at each site for this new version. So that means a repeatable secure stack where uh, security relevant decisions are made in a sensible way. And it makes it as easy as possible for new sites to stand it up. Next slide and automation for deployment and testing. So bugs can be found and deployments can be, uh, or fixes can be deployed quickly. Next slide, please. Thanks. We want to be able to support national projects with platform services like dynamic consent. Uh, so maybe a little further ahead, 
We have DICONS, an architecture for dynamic consent in federated national projects. We're still in the process of prototyping it, but it's informed the decision of Candig's authentication and authorization, especially around service consent tracking and data set modeling. Next slide, please. Thanks. This is built around a, an encrypted third binder, which handles interactions between study data and administrative data, keeping those completely separate and reducing the burden of trust on other components in the distributed system. Next slide, please. So, and then here's a couple areas where we've, we've been uh, deliberately sort of upping our game. So we're dealing with an increasing number of data from different data sources and lots of different models. Uh, so we've been uh, diligently generating realistic synthetic data for each of these data sets, which makes it much easier to develop ETL pipelines, testing code, testing workflows, uh, doing demos. Next slide. Um, policies, we've been greatly clarifying policies, which are essential around accounts, auditable process and accountabilities. It's essential for trust. It's essential for clarity of expectations. But we also want them to be uh, documents that can be templates for new national distributed projects starting up. GR4GH policies and recommendations have strongly informed and, and are sometimes uh, included by reference in our policies. Next slide. Finally, any technical solution incidents will happen. Uh, our incidents have been minor and minor incidents are, are the best ones to start a, a proper incident response process with. Uh, it's really important to get something like that in place so you're communicating lessons and results internally and externally, or else you're not going to learn from the incidents and you're going to keep fighting the same fires. We have a process in place. We've had, thankfully, a few run-throughs, and we really need to grow and strengthen this practice. Next slide, please. And, and this is how we feel uh, we've been supporting uh, three of these responsible data sharing principles in the implementation of our of the next generation platform. Next slide, please. So Candig's growing, uh, which is great, but the Candig growing means there's more responsibility. Next slide. Thank you. So uh, more sites are coming, not all of which will be run by explicitly Candig's teams. That means we're going to have to continue improving ease of deployment, and it probably means we're going to need to reduce the necessary trust levels between sites. We've just heard that there's, uh, you know, remarkable advances in technological solutions to support this. Uh, also, governance will play an increasing role. More data sets are coming. That means we're going to have to continue improving our practices around automation, operations, monitoring, incident report response. And we're going to, we want to enable this stronger role for participants, including but not, not limited to dynamic consent. So we want to implement DICONs for data programs that need it and can support it with appropriate level of people's time. Next slide, please. So responsibility has really been a full stack effort for us, and it's a lot to, for a, a small team to take on. Next slide, please. Here are some of the areas that uh, have been in the past or are, are continuing to be pain points for us. Uh, the clear division of roles has been a huge help once, once it became agreed to. And then after that, effective ongoing operation of policies, supporting DACs, routine day-to-day -day operations of systems, uh, supporting good security practices and development, just the day-to-day -day things. Uh, for Software development, again, I want to call out open source software. Uh, I think it's event essential uh, for, for trust, but it must be, you know, it doesn't test, scrutinize, or audit itself. Just putting code on GitHub doesn't guarantee that someone's going to do that for you. Uh, careful data handling process at each site, careful consent tracking, the basics. Next slide. And GA4GH has been a, a huge help for, the, for us in this. Uh, sometimes with explicit products we can adopt, and I've listed some of them here. But also, even where there's no product available, we can just take this, this community that the GA4GH convenes in meetings like this one has been absolutely essential for us in learning best practices, uh, gaining experiences from other team members, from other colleagues, 
uh, it, it's really supported us as, as we've developed this. And that's it. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Rachel Hendricks Durrup. Um, she is the research director leading the center's real world evidence portfolio. Rachel is a scientist, researcher, health policy and industry professional, journalist and academic within the fields of health policy, business and health innovation, and has served as the Health Policy Council for the Future of Privacy Forum. Rachel is going to speak to us about ethical, legal and governance considerations in the processing, use and sharing of real world data for healthcare and health research. So I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you uh, for the warm introduction. I'm Dr. Rachel Hendricks Stirrup. And um, as you just heard, I'm the research director of real world evidence at the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy located in Washington, DC in the United States. Today, I will go over some ethical, legal, and governance considerations for real world data for healthcare and health research. Next slide. So what is the patient consumer spectrum? Well, that's a spectrum that I identified during my time at uh, working and leading uh, health and genetics initiatives at the Future of Privacy Forum, which is a think tank that is also located in Washington, DC. And at the Future of Privacy Forum, I contributed to the development of this infographic that you see here that illustrates what the patient consumer spectrum looks like today in many cases and in many, um, in many uh, places such as big cities across the United States, um, also uh, smaller cities as well and lots of other places that engage in um, the technological revolution that we're seeing today in the healthcare space. So the patient consumer spectrum uh, is a growing concept in which healthcare is rapidly transitioning from a periodic activity in a fixed traditional healthcare setting to rather an around the clock activity that involves the generation use and integration of data reflecting many aspects of individuals' lives and behaviors. Now, I presented this uh, spectrum during my time at the Future of Privacy Forum at uh, the RightsCon conference. Um, so that uh, happened uh, in 2020, and uh, we received a lot of great feedback um, on this topic because it, the spectrum really is an intersection between what we like to consider regulated health data and unregulated health data. Um, really introducing some complexities, both ethical, legal, and social, that we've never seen before. Um, so there are a number of factors to consider, such as, like you see here in the infographic, uh, there are lots of uh, industrial players, as well as traditional uh, healthcare entities, um, engaged in this full spectrum of consumer health. Um, that could look like um, transportation services through the use of an app uh, to and from uh, healthcare centers. It also looks like uh, direct-to-consumer genetic testing on the go or, uh, or, or by mail. It also looks like someone talking to a nurse bot rather than an actual human nurse in order to uh, facilitate refill prescriptions um, and also uh, to facilitate the exchange of clinical recommendations as well. Um, so again, there's a lot of ethical, legal, and social nuance at play here. Uh, that's unprecedented and that uh, is accompanied by uh, a wide array of challenges that we are beginning to see need uh, to be solved uh, moving forward in order to ensure that uh, no one is harmed essentially in the process of health innovation. Next slide. So as I talk about technological innovation in the healthcare and health research space, it implicates what has been called real world data. There are several definitions of real world data, but in this slide, I focus on definitions put forth by uh, regulatory agencies across multiple uh, countries and regions globally. First, I'll focus on the United States Food and Drug Administration's definition of real world data, which is as they define, data relating to patient health status and or the delivery of healthcare routinely collected from a variety of sources. They uh, describe real world data as uh, an admixture of electronic health record data, claims and billing uh, service data, 
product and disease registries, patient generated data, including uh, home use settings, or at least data generated within home settings, such as Alexa. Um, it could uh, also look like um, uh, home app data, those sorts of things. And also data generated from other sources that can inform uh, anyone on a person's health status, and that includes mobile devices and other, um, other types of uh, personal devices that can collect and, and share health data at any given moment. The European Medicines Agency similarly defines real-world data as data from EHRs, insurance claims, and data from patient registries, genomics data, um, not specifically calling out direct-to-consumer or clinical genomics, which I thought was interesting, also clinical trial data, adverse drug reaction reports, social media, and wearable devices. So social media is an interesting um, insertion here in the EMA's definition of real world data, something that we don't often see here in the United States, such as what you uh, see here in the FDA's definition. And also the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry defines real world data as patient data that are routinely collected outside of clinical trial situations. So as you see here, sometimes the definition of real world data is rooted in uh, the ex data that is uh, excluded um, from clinical trials, but rather, or I'm sorry, it generated outside of clinical trials, but not necessarily excluded from clinical trials or excluded from healthcare. Um, so the spectrum is very wide. Uh, it touches on uh, consumer generated data that could be a clinical utility or that could also uh, be of interest to both regulators and payers. Next slide. So what are implications for real world data across the patient consumer spectrum? So this illustration here essentially describes or, or drives home the point that combined uses of various types of data uh, hold, as I mentioned, unprecedented legal, regulatory, ethical, and social challenges, as well as sensitivities that um, today are largely addressed on a case-by-case -case basis rather than on a broad policy, enforceable policy uh, basis. Right now, we just see a lot of best practices. Um, there's little shared guidance um, around ways to enforce those best practices. But uh, in any case, we're at a very uh, early starting point or frontier. So in this diagram, you see that the green circle illustrates data that is uh, generated uh, in traditional healthcare settings and that is accompanied therefore by a regulatory paradigm. Um, however, the data contained in the blue and purple circles represent data that is largely unregulated. And what introduces the most complexity is when all of these data are combined in one or more ways as the arrows indicate here. And once those data are combined, depending on who's housing the data, it really depends on how the, the data is being regulated and protected from a privacy standpoint. So for example, if EHR data is combined with direct-to-consumer genetic testing data, uh, it, in, and it really depends, um, at least from a privacy standpoint, it really depends on um, who, is, who is housing that data um, and what the legal uh, agreements and, uh, and requirements are to the use and sharing of that data um, once the data is shared or housed or stored by one or more entities. So the data, for example, genomic data, if it's housed and stored by a direct-to-consumer genetic testing company that offers genetic testing as a health-related product, if that information is shared by a consumer with the consumer's doctor, um, therefore rendering that consumer now a patient, and the doctor takes action on that data, then there are some blurred lines there. Now, now, even though the genetic report is housed by the doctor at that point, it's also still housed by the genetic testing company, the direct-to-consumer genetic testing company. So really, it's unclear the, the extent to which privacy is truly uh, enforced and safeguarded in this particular situation. So this is something to think about from a, a legal and regulatory standpoint with regard to uh, real world data across the patient consumer spectrum, especially as it implicates genomic data. Next slide. Now, another challenge that we're seeing today uh, is open data, especially open data that uh, contains genomics uh, and health data. So open genome data is currently available online. 
Um, some examples include Open Humans, uh, the Personal Genome Project as well. Um, these databases include identifiable genomic and patient consumer information, what we would call here in the United States protected health information under, um, under HIPAA, which is the, the uh, traditional healthcare privacy law. And also, we are seeing uh, broad societal implications around the use and analytics of open data, um, especially as algorithms are, uh, can be, are or can be deployed in order to draw inferences around this data as it is uh, publicly available about a particular individual. Um, so from, a, again, a legal standpoint, the implications to this are currently underexplored. Right now, the literature and also uh, anecdotal uh, evidence suggests that there are, there are several implications to consider. And that's what you see in my final bullet points at the end of this slide, such as lifelong and short-term disability and long-term care insurance companies might have an interest in this data as it's openly available online about a particular individual. They can use this information in their underwriting considerations to therefore deny or approve um, health insurance coverage for a particular individual and or their family members. Also, some considerations are around home mortgage lending. So if uh, a person's genetic information is openly available online, and if that information suggests that the person is susceptible to a disease that would limit their lifespan, then mortgage companies um, might have an interest in, uh, in looking further into a 30-year mortgage application to the extent that the, the mortgage uh, lender might not believe that the person will be alive long enough to pay off their mortgage. Also, military, uh, military service, um, those who are interested in becoming military members or members of, um, for example, the United States uh, Army or, or any branch of the military, um, there are implications there. And in fact, um, the, uh, the military issued a statement in the United States essentially a uh, warning uh, active duty members about engagement in direct to consumer genetic testing because it could certainly, uh, the information generated by those tests could certainly be used against uh, the, uh, the enlistment applicant. And also there are implications um, that are unknown for biological family members. So if a single individual shares their genomic data online, it is unknown to what extent that might affect their biological family members, both known and unknown. And also genomic and health data that's publicly available can be exploited politically, and it can also result in employment discrimination. However, the burden of proof rests on an employee to prove that their genetic information was in fact used to discriminate against them in the workplace. So there's a power dynamic that's also introduced there that is hard to uh, navigate as uh, some case studies have shown. So these are a few things to consider with regard to open data to the extent that it includes genomics and health data. Next slide. Now, GA4GH has put forth goals and recommendations um, on this topic, and um, they continue to do so by engaging um, members on the topic. So some of the goals uh, among GA4GH include uh, engaging individuals and in, or rather interdisciplinary teams to identify and examine some of these real world ethical, legal and social implications and scenarios. Also, um, there are recommendations to build research capacity to apply novel theories such as behavioral economics theory to truly examine uh, ethical motivations or biases that lead uh, or result from broad open sharing of genomic health information across the patient consumer spectrum, essentially. And also there are recommend recommendations to engage institutional state and national policymakers in these discussions to understand um, what evidence is needed, what are some actionable strategies that can be taken moving forward, and what are some enforceable data governance strategies as well um, that are rooted in best practice where there's an absence of current law or regulation to safeguard individual privacy and other harms as well, not only privacy. Next slide. So here's a list of my relevant research to date on the topic. Um, you can feel free to take a screenshot of this um, should you be interested in uh, reading some studies that I've conducted on this topic that might be of interest uh, to you or your work. And next slide. Here's my contact information. 
Uh, my email is listed here. You can feel free to email me at any time at my uh, Duke Margolis email address, rachel.hendricks.syrup at duke.edu. Thank you very much for all of your time today. And I really appreciate you uh, taking a moment to uh, learn a little bit more about real world data and its implications for the GA4GH community. Fantastic. Thank you, Rachel, for that. Um very thought provoking talk. Um, so we're on to our last speaker now. Um, I'm very pleased to welcome Anna Lewis. Anna is a research associate at the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics um, at Harvard. She is currently working on projects at the intersection of race, genetics and ethics and on the clinical rollout of polygenic scores um, as part of the eMERGE consortium and also on policy around return of genetic results in research studies. Uh, Anna will tell us today about return of results. So I'll hand over to Anna. Thank you. Hello, it's a delight to be here. Thank you, Alice, for that introduction and for the uh, preceding speakers. Uh, so I was invited to talk to tell you about GA4GH's new policy on the return of results. Uh, but I'm going to use my time to also make an appeal for a renewed focus on the human and human genetics and genomics research if we're going to have any hope to bridge to health. Um, next slide, please. So a lot of what GA4GH is about is about making these beautifully aggregated and harmonized data sets that enable the science that we do. Um, but next slide, please. I think it's easy for us to forget that every column in this data is a human, uh, a uniquely situated individual human um, with their own uh, with their own complex uh, context. And uh, these are humans who have rights. And as researchers, these are humans that you have duties towards. And that gets us to the return of results. So if we go to the next slide, please. And the fact that there is now an emerging or maybe stronger, more strongly put, an emerged ethical and legal consensus supporting the return of clinically actionable results to research participants. And on the ethics side, there's a really broad patchwork of reasoning, all of which mutually reinforces uh, the return of such results. So on the right side, you've got the right to access, the right to be informed. On the duty side, we've got the duty of care, the duty to warn, the duty of rescue. Uh, the value of reciprocity is appealed to. Uh, research participants give us their data, do they get anything in return? And straightforward appeals to beneficence, i.e. doing good, the opportunity to do some good um, and help out these research participants. So that's the ethical landscape. On the legal side, um, here's a review from some GA4GH members um, uh, back from 2018 where uh, it, it, they show just a huge amount of, of legal mandates to return uh, certain results under certain circumstances. And um, in the context of genetics research, the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences, in collaboration with the WHO, stated in 2016, there's an emerging consensus that at least some findings in genetic research must be returned to individual donors if they wish, and that life-saving information and data of immediate clinical utility involving a significant health problem must be offered for disclosure. Uh, next slide, please. And this return of results is also part of a broader cultural transition in the research enterprise. So we used to talk about research subjects. That sounds like old lingo now. Now we talk about research participants. And some projects have moved to talk about research partners. And we look um, and expect that there's much uh, greater engagement with our research participants uh, and that we're much more transparent about what we're doing with their data and why. And also, uh, there's a much greater focus on, on returning value to some research participants. And we know in genomics, um, partly because of a, 
um, large review done by Dania Virzital, also associated with our regulatory and ethics work stream, that research participants in genomic studies greatly uh, desire and value the return of genomic results. Uh, next slide, please. But here's the big gotcha. Returning results is hard and uh, resource intensive. Here's a flow chart from a current, um, it's currently a preprint from the Genomes to People program about return of results in a biobank. And it's complicated. There's a great many steps that, that, that are needed. Um, there's all sorts of things uh, that you need in place and people with various different skill sets that you need to be involved in this process. And next slide, please. Uh, and I think we often see this as intention with this, uh, this drive to get as large a sample size as possible. If you've got a finite pot of money, uh, you can spend so much per participant. If you're going to return results, your cost per participant is going to go up. So your sample size is going to go down. And I think that this, uh, I think we often see it in this way. And I think we shouldn't see it in this way. We can no, we should no longer be able to appeal to this trade-off when we think about um, what we what we should do for our research participants. So next slide, please. Uh, so to tell you about this this policy, um, so this uh, um, this is a policy that has been many years in the making. Um, so I'm showing here. Um, the, my two other co-chairs and putting together this policy, one of whom is my mentor, Robert Green, and uh, Bath and Offers, who has been deeply involved with GA4GH since the very start. And they just, they first got talking about the need for a policy um, on returning results um, many years ago. And it's taken um, many years to come to fruition, partly because this has been the most contentious of all the regulatory and ethics work stream outputs, the hardest to reach consensus, the one where we've had the most comments from other members of GA4GH and also members of the public. And I'll tell you a bit, try and explain a bit why it has it was uh, it was uh, so hard to, to arrive at consensus on this policy. Um, but you know, why would GA4GH want a policy on the return of results? Well, there's a clear link to its core mission. When data is shared, the knowledge that the initial researchers responsibly address the return of results can reassure data repositories aggregating those data and researchers conducting secondary research with those data that obligations to return results have been seriously considered and addressed with research participants. And data repositories and researchers conducting secondary research may have their own duties with regards to addressing the return of results. But we wanted to take just as a, a sort of a starting point establishing the minimum core obligations for the original researchers. Um, and I just want to emphasize also that uh, return of results within my field, which is LC, ethical, legal and social implications of genomics. This is one of the biggest topics. We're dealing with a truly ginormous literature and many people who, who devote their, their um, professional lives to this topic. So I'm going to skirt over a great, great many um, subtleties and points of debate um, today. And the focus of GA4GH's policy is on clinically actionable genomic results. Um, that is results that indicate risk for or the presence of a condition for which prevention or treatment is available. Um, next slide, please. So the aims of the policy are to provide a reference point for the management of return of results um, and to identify common ground while al allowing for appropriate customization, both by um, jurisdiction and by um, specific project. Um, so we have six policy points that we managed to all agree on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the first is the need for a clear protocol that is adhered to. And a lot of this is about planning and accountability. So um, as mentioned earlier, there are huge number of moving pieces when it comes to actually returning results to individuals. All of that needs to be thought through in advance, um, uh, go through the IRB or, or appropriate ethics review, etc. And also I think um, sometimes 
putting returning results in a protocol and putting it in an informed consent um, can be taken to, by researchers to be more sort of permission to return rather than an obligation to return. So it's really also important that the protocol is adhered to and the researchers can be held um, a, a, to account for what they've promised to do in that protocol. Uh, next one, please. And the second one was the need for upfront resourcing. Um, GA4GH has you know, uh, strongly advocated for line items in budgets for data sharing, and we're going to need the same thing for return of results. Um, and also resourcing includes making sure that the people with the right skills for the various different component pieces um, are available. Uh, next, please. Um, the link to clinical standards. So I'll now quote from the policy. In deciding the parameters for return of clinically actionable genomic results, researchers should be guided by current practice regarding the clinical standard of care within their jurisdictions. So we tend to think of research and clinic as separate uh, endeavors. Um, this link might seem suspicious to some. So we've got uh, a three pronged justification for it. Um, first of all, it's the prospect of a clinical action that motivates such return in the first place. Um, and it's the su to support such action that standards in the clinical setting have been adopted. So they, they seem relevant there. And second, relevant clinical standards will be appropriately sensitive to the health system context, including its cost structure, legal system, and additional constraints of the location of the participants. Um, so to talk about some differences that this might encapsulate, um, uh, ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics, advocates for opportunistic screening in the context of clinical whole exome or whole genome sequencing. Um, the European Society of Human Genetics says that this should not be done because of unclear benefit to harm and benefit to cost ratios. Um, third justification is the blurring of the research clinical divide, suggesting that harmonization could lead to consistency across the continuum of clinical care, clinical trials, research studies embedded in health systems, other research studies and population biobanks. Um, okay, and uh, that diagram there is uh, attempts to square the circle. And this was really at the policy point that uh, allowed us to achieve consensus on this policy. I'll say more about that later. Next slide, please. Fourth, the need for community engagement. What to return, how to return it? Well, you might well have, if you're a research study getting going, to, to engage uh, members of your community to work out how best to do this. And this can seem like quite an intimidating prospect, but luckily there's a great GA4GH resource you can draw on for this. If we can go to the next slide, please. Um, is a, is a, a new engagement framework. Mm -hmm. Um, ably uh, led by Mavis, Madeline and Clara, a framework for involving and engaging participants, patients and publics in genomics research and health implementation. It enables the consideration of the aims and purposes of engagement and reflection on the strengths, limitations and likely outcomes and impacts of various approaches for engagement. And it does that by providing a series of reflexive questions um, for those uh, developing involvement and engagement plans and activities. So uh, that's a great resource that that, that um, anybody can draw on. Next slide, please. Next policy point, sharing of resources. So when we publish our papers, there's all sorts of things that we spent ages and ages and ages developing that don't always see the light of day. So that this includes our actual protocols, um, our consent forms, uh, the ways that we've decided to measure outcomes, the tools that we've done to do so, all of these um, could and should be shared between projects, and this will help lower the barriers to return results to individual participants. Um, next slide, please. And finally, another thing that helped us um, achieve consensus is funders are urged to, um, to support the return of results. They can set aside resources, um, to, to support the return of results and those projects that plan to do so. So evidence suggests the existence of a large gap between what researchers would consider best practice for returning results and what's currently being implemented. 
Um, and additionally, such funding would generate data that we sorely, sorely need on cost to benefit and risk to benefit of returning genomic information at all. Um, the gathering of this evidence supports the human right of everyone to benefit from science and its applications, the fundamental philosophy that animates GA4GH. Um, next slide, please. So here's a question for the audience. Um, what genomic information, if returned to a healthy person who desired that information, would be clearly clinically beneficial to them? Um, so fundamentally, this was what made consensus hard to achieve, because many people in this debate think that when you actually look at the available evidence, this is an empty set across most contexts, uh, that benefits are not sufficiently established for any single piece of genomic information. And we pat ourselves on the back when we find a genetic disease association and genetics papers are often written as if all that's needed is the last mile of clinical translation um, to get to benefiting individuals and having a health impact. But that's simply not the case. Finding those association only gets us to the starting line. And I think this state of affairs should really make us stop and think, has our research agenda been focused on the right things? Next slide, please. So a comment when this policy was going through the steering committee was, Oh, you know, this seems, you know, somehow not as concrete as the other sort of GA4GH products. It seems way more amorphous. And this wasn't designed as a criticism, but as an observation. Uh, next slide, please. And I think it's because in the research world, we're often abstracting away from the human. It becomes very easy to lose track of the fact that these columns are humans who are messy and complicated with varying contexts that determine the meaning and relevance of their genetic information. And this in turn means that something that's perhaps more one size fits all is not going to work. And we need something that tries to reflect the complexity that is the relationship between each of us to our own genetics. So I'm going to end on an appeal to focus on the human connection um, of, of which returning results is just one part as a key component of responsible use. Next slide, please. I think our abstractions in genetics research are often too aggressive. And most of the time we don't collect data um, in a way that reflects that each column in a genetic data set is a human. And the sort of real push and drive and obsession with sample size eclipses this. We often don't set up our studies to learn who might benefit and under which conditions from learning anything about their own genetics. In part because we don't gather enough of the right sort of data to understand each individual's context and or we lose that when we aggregate data. So we use the data responsibly when we treat it not as a column in a data set, but as just one aspect of a complex human. And we also will do better science that way, science that has a better chance of bridging from genomics to improved health. And I'll close on that and say that the policy, next slide please, is available on GA4GH's website. And we also have a paper which gives a condensed version of it. Um, with thanks to Robert and Bartha, the Return of Results Task Force and dozen members of the public for enabling us to get to consensus on that. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. A bit of feedback. Turn this down. OK. Um, I can see the questions, but I can't read them. Let me see. That might just be my eyesight. Zoom in a bit. Um, so we've got some great questions, which I think I can read now. Brilliant. Um, so I'm just going to go straight in. Um, I think some of these questions are directed to speakers, but as this is you know, a discussion, if any other panel members want to jump in, do go ahead. Uh, firstly, Rachel. Um, do you think the COVID-19 pandemic has helped the public feel more comfortable with sharing these kind of data and dealing with virtual healthcare? That's a great question. Um, I will say that my work, um, you know, non-COVID related per se, but I will say that my work with the rare disease community has revealed that that particular community, given their the rarity of their diseases, yet the urgency for treatment, they are more willing to share their data uh, for health research purposes, um, mainly because if they don't, then it, the risks would outweigh the benefits of not sharing. Um, so I would probably assign that logic to uh, COVID-19 such that um, it could be the case that uh, individuals who uh, experienced adverse um, health events during COVID-19, they may have been or become um, more willing to share their data in the event that 
uh, emergency cases uh, warrant um, a, a greater motive to share that data. Um, now, I can't necessarily cite evidence um, to substantiate that claim, but uh, I would imagine that that could be the case during COVID-19, such that given, it's emer given that it is an emergency, it could have uh, prompted more individuals to become more comfortable about sharing their data for purposes of identifying uh, treatments and other types of uh, services that could be of benefit to them from a health standpoint. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want anything to add before we move on? No. Okay. Um, Anna, but also I think Rachel can um, add to this. Given how much thought goes into return of results, what do you think um, about what Rachel pointed out as to unregulated genomic information going direct to consumer through various um, different areas that Rachel pointed out? Yeah, well, I'll say two things. I, th I think, firstly, I think some of the direct-to-consumer genomics companies that return health information actually do a really good job of contextualizing that information and packaging it up and making it understandable. Probably a better job than um, than many labs do. Uh, although, so so I think they they sort of realize the the pressures of what does it take to uh, make information relevant to a person. Um, uh, I think they take that side of things or can take that side of things very seriously. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that I think that it's uh, quite easy to sell snake oil in this, um, in this field. And I think that our attitude to publishing genetics research makes that easier rather than harder. So we have these polygenic risk scores that capture a tiny percent of the variants um, of a trait in a population that that make a big splash in the science side of things. Um, and we don't talk so much about the actual effect sizes. And then you you read the sort of press releases of the companies that are then selling them, and you see how they got exactly from that, from the way that we talk about the research. So um, I do think that there's problems with how uh, how some genetics is sold to consumers. And I think we could take some more responsibility for, for getting um, sort of the uh, significance of the results um, better across. Thank you. Um, OK, we'll move on to the next question. Uh, OK, JP. Um, you said the robustness of the method scales with, this, um, with the size of the federation. Um, is it therefore relevant for smaller consortia? Okay, now maybe this uh, was a misformulation from my, my side. What I mean is that the kind of techniques I've shown uh, means that as long as one of the centers is not corrupt, the whole system is robust and is protected. So, which means that since there are three centers, it would already require the attacker to compromise each of the three. Now, if there are 20 centers, it, it, it make, makes, of course, the job of the attacker even more complicated. This is what I meant, but I would say that even with sm small numbers, the, this kind of solution is considered to be robust enough and way, way above the kind of protection that are pro uh, provided by existing systems. Okay, so related question for Jonathan. Can you imagine a use case for homomorphic encryption with Candig? Oh yes, abs uh, absolutely can. Uh, we looked into this early on as a proof of concept using much less state-of-the-art uh, approaches than we saw today. Uh, I think absolutely. Uh, as, the, uh, as, as we grow to in the federation size and, and have less trust between sites or even less trust between projects across sites, I think it could be uh, very useful. Uh, we also looked at differential privacy, which solves a mostly different set of problems. Uh, but for us, it was about also supporting potentially less trusted users to still be able to do certain discovery or, or analysis problems. So I think I think that I think both of those approaches are you know, are, make very much, you know, make a lot of sense as we try to scale the impact. 
Great, thank you. And another question for you, actually. Um, does DICONS, the dynamic consent, um, reuse jury products, like, for example, GO4GH passports and Duo? And do you have any feedback for others on um, what prevents adoption or, or works well, depending on the case? Yeah, so I think um, what, uh, in terms of use of uh, jury products, yes, we're, we're looking very, we're tracking uh, developments on, on uh, Duo very, very closely uh, for, for tracking and documenting the consent. And not so much in, in DICONS, but on the, uh, the authorization side of things, we're using uh, not whole passports, but uh, passport visas as claims for tracking the, the uh, entitlements of a, of a research user. So I think in terms of adoption, adopting those, those jury products, I think there's a lot of, um, uh, I think there's a lot of interest and I don't think there's big roadblocks. Thank you. Okay, jumping around a bit more, sorry, I'll try and uh, make this understandable for everybody. Um, but JP, uh, you said that auditing open source software is essential. What advice do you have on effective audits and what body conducts them? Yeah, so uh, indeed, uh, open source software and its, and its auditing are there typically to reinforce trust and to find bugs, right? As we know, uh, nevertheless, uh, there are well-known example of, uh, you know, for example, internet protocols that had been used for years and that were open source and that bugs actually vulnerabilities have been found uh, at a later stage. So it's not an absolute guarantee, as we know, right? So achieving security is is, is very tricky. Uh, so so typically, uh, peer reviewing is something that is can be very very helpful. But there are also companies that uh, you can pay and they make uh, an audit for you. Uh, again, it's not an absolute, uh, an absolute guarantee, but if they are able to line up the appropriate specialists, it can be a very, very significant help for the identification of res residual uh, vulnerabilities. So I, th I think one has to take all these kind of precautions and there are additional pre uh, precautions to be taken, such as, for example, uh, uh, pen testing is something that is uh, done very routinely in, uh, in hospitals. So running really batteries of, uh, uh, let's say, simulated attacks to identify uh, vulnerabilities online, uh, you know, white hat uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, scenarios is, is something that is also very helpful and is actually recommended practice. Great, thank you. Um, okay, Rachel, um, what would you consider effective policy to both protect patient privacy rights while also supporting the value of data sharing for the broader good? That's a great question. I think uh, privacy regulators are still trying to figure that out. They're, um, and when I say privacy regulators, I mean across multiple countries, not just in the United States, and then also within the United States at various state levels. Um, we are seeing some movement um, at the state level uh, here in the United States where Colorado, Virginia, and uh, California have implemented comprehensive privacy laws uh, that intend to protect uh, various types of um, what I call patient consumer data. Um, but really, uh, you know, that that is limited in its effectiveness, um, clearly because that's only three states out of 50 plus. And also um, globally, we see um, the uh, General Data Protection um, Act in uh, European nations where um, patient consumer spectrum type of data um, are included as sensitive categories of data. Um, but again, a lot of these laws focus mainly on the type of data and not necessarily on the uses of data. Um, so there is a fine line to walk there. It is important to categorize or classify certain types of data as a protected uh, or sensitive category of data. Um, but even then, when the when that data type is made available to the public, as I discussed or illustrated um, with Open Humans and the Personal Genome Project, um, there are different implications to consider there and from a privacy protection standpoint, at least uh, privacy protection that's legally enforceable. Um, so there are uh, there's lots of nuance there, and again, they're still trying to figure this out. 
um, even when thinking about genetic data or genomic data, there hasn't, or at least there's there's not a lot of agreement even in the definitions of those terms. Um, so still there's a lot of work to be done uh, from a nomenclature standpoint in order to understand what protections should accompany what types of data and then moving on from there in what contextual situations are these laws enforceable or not. So there's a lot of work to be done, as I mentioned, in this space. And uh, I think the GA4, GH community is well poised to uh, at least inform some of these uh, legislative or policymaking uh, uh, conversations and decisions being made on the topic. Thank you. Um, I wanted to jump to this question next because I this came in when you were talking, Rachel. I, I think it's for you, but um, could an economic model that incentivizes all participants be created? Mm. I think that came in when we were talking about um, real world data. Ah, JP, sorry. I'm happy to volunteer for this one because we have devoted a lot of thoughts to, to this and I've also published extensively on, uh, on, on game theory in, uh, in prior research. So, so the, the thing is the following is that if you think about it, right, take the simple example of co collaboration between two sides, A and B, right? With the conventional approach, uh, data are transferred either from A to B or from B to A. If A transfers to B, uh, essentially, A loses control of their own data and vice versa. So there's a disincentive in the current uh, 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 situation. With the current, uh, with the kind of tools that I've mentioned, with the uh, federated learning, where data are not transferred anymore, then everyone benefits without losing control on, on their data and the game remains fully symmetric. And one can show that can, it is possible in this way to move from, uh, let's say, a non cooperative Nash equilibrium to a Nash equilibrium that becomes uh, actually cooperative. Uh, so, this, I, I think, is, is going to be a, a, a big, uh, uh, essentially, game changer in this uh, uh, on the cooperation landscape. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Anna, is there a need for guidance to help researchers return results so that participants can appropriately gauge the weight of these results? Yeah, so when we say researchers, it's not the same people who are plugging away at the code. Like, usually you would set it up so that um, somebody like a genetic counsellor would return these results. And I don't think what we're lacking is guidance. There's a lot published out there. Um, lessons learned from all sorts of different um, projects, general best practices for returning genetic results to individuals. Um, what we're what we're missing is the will to actually do this. Like, it's complicated, and it's just easier not to do it. That's that's the thing that's got to change. That's the thing we're missing. Okay, and uh, an additional question: How do you think the best way to overcome that is? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think that we, we can all do a better job at raising eyebrows when um, when somebody's launching um, a new project and, and not wanting to return results. I think the other thing is, is that we can generate data which actually shows that returning genetic results to individuals is beneficial. Like, isn't that just a damning indictment of the whole field? that there's no consensus, nobody can agree on a single piece of information in the genome that it would be beneficial to return to a healthy individual. Like, I think, that I, I find that kind of shocking. Like, the promise of genomic medicine seems to always be around the corner, and it's still always around the corner. Um, so we've got, to, we've got to also change that and convince more people that it, it does, it can be helpful to individuals to receive genetic information about themselves. Thank you. Well, I think uh, that's an interesting point. We have just different parties would, I think, have different uh, perspectives on the usefulness of the data. But um, in the interest of time, we will uh, move on to the next one. Um, so, Jonathan, um, you wanted to make it easier. You said you wanted to make the process of what you were doing easier than other national projects in Canada. Um, have there been any similar initiatives and what specifically did you do uh, that made it easier? Oh, there's definitely, um, so yeah, there's a couple of things. In terms of supporting other research data projects, I think these these policies have uh, uh, 
have have definitely started conversations more easily. I think it, it's still pretty new yet, but I'm pretty uh, com uh, confident about that. In terms of supporting other infrastructures, other platforms, uh, there definitely have been others and, and uh, will continue to be others. Uh, right now, uh, maybe the, the biggest impact, right now we're uh, uh, helping with the, the digital health and discovery platform, um, a, a, a slightly different infrastructure project uh, across Canada. And I think that the policies that we've put in place, the division of roles and responsibilities, has really helped clarify the division of roles and responsibilities between DHDP and one of the flagship projects it wants to support. So, so yeah, I mean, I, this this work is uh, this policy work and this policy work supported by J4GH is is really important, and it does it does speed up, uh, does accelerate other efforts. Thank you. Um, okay, that's next, JP. Um, the question, oh, oh, there it is. Uh, this person wasn't quite clear on the amount of work needed at the remote endpoint site, e.g. an existing cohort. Okay, so the way this works, so there is a, a certain number of data providers. So, so each of them is, for example, a hospital that is part of the, of the confederation. So each of them uh, has to prepare its own data sets. So it's essentially the ETL procedure uh, that uh, uh, requires homogeneity in the way the data is formatted across the different sites and an homolo let's say uh, homogeneity in terms of ontologies. Uh, we know that unfortunately this is not, uh, cannot be taken for granted. So in some cases uh, adaptations that are needed um, it helps if uh, the hospitals or say data providers are already using something such as uh, uh, I2B2 or OMOP Odyssey uh, or something that is essentially the first step, step in that uh, direction and will facilitate the uh, overall consistency uh, of, the, of, of the system. Thank you. Oh, there's another question for you here. So we'll go straight into that. Um, can Medco's federated analytics capabilities be translated into new GA4GH standards that anyone can implement? Absolutely. So this is something that uh, that can be done. And so we have had a number of discussions, notably with the colleagues of the CloudWorks stream. Uh, it's still maybe a little bit of it ahead of its time with respect to the metabolism of GA4GH. But I think very soon, uh, actually, it, it 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 has to happen at some at some point. It can be Medco or something, of the in the in the same league. Uh, but it's certainly a conversation conversation that uh, deserves being pushed uh, uh, further. And so, in the slide, I've just uh, to try to sketch how it would, would uh, look like. But there is clearly still work to be done to refine the the related uh, APIs in particular. Thank you. So there's an open question to the panel here. Um, what are the best examples the panel have seen of projects explaining data security issues and risk benefit of results to participants? Does anyone like to go first? I think that's a really good question. Um, when they say, or at least when the audience member asks for, you know, particular examples, um, I think one example that I brought up is within the rare disease community, where, quite frankly, the privacy and, and security risks to data sharing, um, it's, they simply don't outweigh the benefits or potential benefits for this population. So I think we have to approach this question population or, um, or person even in mind, um, because that's certainly not a question that I think can be answered with a blanket answer. Uh, it, it really depends on the situation. It depends on the, uh, the urgency of the situation. Uh, we talked about COVID-19 being another example of those urgencies. Um, and I think from there, we're able to better contextualize uh, examples where data security issues 
simply don't outweigh the benefits to, to data sharing or return of results. And if I could, uh, uh, yeah, agree with that, um, this is part of this issue that uh, what the risks and benefits are depend sensitively on the context um, that somebody finds themselves in. So it's not going to be possible to have a like, you know, in all cases, um, you know, this is what this is what the trade offs are. Um, and what that means is that if you have your own situation and you're thinking about what the risks and benefits are going to be, then you're going to have to find the things which are most similar to, to your setting. And there have been some studies that look at this translational piece and um, you can f find them in the literature. So, for example, in the US for like um, more sort of general populations, there's the CESA consortium, which have published a lot on this. And depending on the country and then depending on the particular community, you, you can dig in deep. But I would agree with Rachel that there's no one stop shop. Thank you. Um, OK, well, we'll move on to the next question. We've got a few more minutes, so hopefully we can um, cover a few more. Um, Anna, um, as part of more open research articles, is it not possible to include um, all of these resources that you mentioned, like the protocols, the consent forms, etc., cetera, um, in that process? I think that could be a great mechanism to doing some of this resource sharing, and it relies on people actually doing that and taking advantage of these um, more open platforms' abilities to, to share various different types of information. So, yes, even fewer excuses not to do this. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, a question from Tommy JP. Um, what is the software licensing support model for a data federation based on Medco encryption? Right. Hello, Tommy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we have tried as much as possible to have it uh, uh, open source. Uh, and um, actually, now the, there are different, as we know, different uh, variations of. Uh, open source and uh, not each module has exactly the same license. So I'm happy to provide you with uh, details, but I don't want to bother the audience with, let's say, technical considerations about these uh, the licensing uh, issues. So I, I, but, but please drop in an email with your specific uh, uh, questions. But essentially, the goal is to be as much as possible uh, open source and uh, in such a way that this can be also open source of scrutiny of the, of the community. Great, thank you. Okay, I'll try and get through a few more. Um, what have we got? Okay, JP, um, federated database uh, data models may not be compatible. It looks like there is still a need to query, move some of the metadata before running an analysis. Yeah, well, this refers to something that uh, I already mentioned, right? That uh, there is indeed an effort that uh, has to be made in some cases where there is not enough homogeneity in the data formats. And so the metadata aspect has to be taken also into account. Yeah. Um, okay, we've done that question. I think this is the last question um, for JP. Does Medco use I2B2 as a native language or is it just as easy to use OM, uh, to move to OMOP? OMOP, yeah. Yeah, so uh, actually we took I2B2 just as an example. It's not that we, we are particularly enamored with that, uh, with the tool, uh, but it exists, uh, it does the job, it is... Uh, very widespread in a uh, number of uh, US hospitals. It is also somewhat used in in uh, Swiss hospitals, not everywhere, however. So we just took it as, as an example to show that uh, that it works, uh, that what we've done works and can be plugged into existing platforms. But of course, it could be replaced relatively easily in order to take, uh, for example, uh, uh, OMOP, if people prefer, uh, prefer that, absolutely. Thank you. So we're at time. There's a few more questions that we can aim to answer um, offline, but um, I think that brings to the end um, our session. And thank you very much to all the speakers for those fanta fantastic talks and really thought provoking ideas and for all the questions. We had lots of questions. So thank you, everybody, for submitting those. And um, we have a break now. Uh, now, let me check the time that we're coming back, which is in various different time zones. It's a 15 minute break. So let me hope I get this right, but could we be back at 5 2.
whichever in your time zone.